I think there are probably two things that on that three to five year time frame, which is short. Uh, it is short. Uh, <laughs> give me some. And could be long. Too. Yes, and, and also long. Uh, they, they give me some cautious optimism. One is I think on the regulatory and, and government and policy side, I think there's just more and more attention to these issues. There are frameworks, there are definitions of bias. So I think that there's just a lot more attention to that. Um, I think though that uh, this is such a fast moving area. I mean, there's just so much stuff going on in the market that those regulatory and oversight solutions are only gonna get us so far. In, in view of everything that's happening, like things are moving in many ways too quickly for the regulators to catch up. And so I think for me, if I were to um, have an optimistic vision of the future, I think that really solving this data bottleneck, it, which I'm working on, which a lot of other people are working on, is really the critical thing for solving the bias problem, but the accuracy and trustworthiness problem um, writ large, both because we need more people and more diverse people who have access to data, who are able to build AI products that serve the needs of the populations that they care about, not just the populations in Palo Alto and nothing against the populations of Palo Alto <laughs> and Rochester, Minnesota, but you know the rest of the country is also important um, and algorithms need to see their data and reflect their needs. Um, and we also need those data to critically evaluate the algorithms that are coming from researchers, from industry, from lots of other places. And it can't just be these small academic centers and studies like Sarah and I do. It has to be a much broader based effort um, where people are evaluating algorithms in new data that the algorithm has never seen. That's the, the secret sauce of machine learning in every other industry and it needs to be applied to healthcare as well.